Thank you very much, Catherine. And thank you everyone for taking some time out of your day to hear me blabber. I am going to be talking about the upside of downtime, how to turn a disaster into an opportunity. Let me start off by asking everyone that's listening to say yes in the chat room if your site or your company's site has gone down unexpectedly. So you'll find the chat room on the bottom left. We'll see who's uh, paying attention, who's already asleep. All right. <laughs> Oops, I'm going to change my slides here. <laughs> All right. Sorry about that. Well, <laughs> All right, well, let me ask the reverse now. Who hasn't had a site go down, go down on them unexpectedly? Oh, there's uh, Alberto. All right, well, there's always that one guy. I knew it. I think we should probably uh, schedule a webcast with that guy after, after this. He's, he knows something that we may not know. So let me quickly introduce myself. My name is Lenny Rachitsky. I work at the Webmetrics division of Newstar. I am head of R&D there. And what we do is we monitor websites for availability and performance. And so that means I've seen a lot of sites go down in the past decade that I've been working there. I've also been blogging for a couple years. I blog at transparentuptime.com. And I write about downtime events, transparency, things like that. I've also built a bunch of stuff on my own and inside the company. Um, and so I've seen what downtime feels like personally. So no question, sites go down a lot. Pretty much every site on the internet goes down at some point, including the biggest sites on, on the web, sites like Amazon and Facebook and Wikipedia and Microsoft and CNN. And downtime really sucks for a lot of different reasons. It sucks for your business. Obviously, you can't sell anything when your site's down. No one can buy anything. It sucks for your brand. It's really bad press, and you have to work extra hard to make up for the hit that downtime brings. I don't have to tell how, uh, you guys how stressful it is when sites go down. I'm guessing most of you guys, like me, have to deal with downtime when, when a site goes down to bring the servers back up, and that's uh, very little fun. Of course, it sucks for your users, assuming they actually like to use your service. The more that, you, the more that they like your service, the more the downtime hurts them. So no surprise, downtime sucks. What can we do about it? Well, one approach is to build your site so that it never fails. You can build your system with the best people, the most expensive hardware, no single points of failure. You could have backup systems for your backup systems. You can build it in the cloud. You can fail over across clouds. You can automate the heck out of it. You can have hot swappable data centers, complexity budgets and procedures, but like Warner Vogels, the CTO of Amazon famously said, everything fails all the time. And not only do things fail, they fail all the time. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to be arguing with this guy. He's uh, only built the most advanced and powerful computing platform the world has ever known with Amazon EC2. So why? Why does everything fail? Why is it so hard to avoid failures when millions of dollars is riding on it not failing? Well, there's actually a lot of reasons. The first is something called risk homeostasis, which basically says that the safer we make a system, the more risks we end up taking to compensate. For example, there's been at least three studies that have shown that anti-lock brakes actually make people drive more recklessly. Same thing with um, bicycle helmets and airbags. There's also black swan events, which are events that are high impact, hard to predict, that no one saw coming, but are obvious in hindsight and actually end up mattering the most in the end. Things like the crazy drop in the stock market a few months ago, or the YouTube downtime a number of years ago that was caused by some routing table changes in uh, Pakistan. Then there's unknown unknowns, things that you don't even know that you don't know. How can you architect your fail-safe system around things that you don't even know that you should be knowing about. And then there's just change, that as soon as you think you understand everything that's going on with your system, and everything's perfect and is never going to fail, you have to evolve your business. You have to add features. And you don't want to be that guy that's resisting change. Another reason things fail is most oftentimes, big failures are caused by a bunch of really small failures. 
combining into a domino effect. And that kind of stuff is really hard to foresee. In the end, a lot of this just comes down to the fact that we're human and we don't anticipate everything. We're not good at understanding highly complex systems. We don't interpret things correctly. We make mistakes. So let me give you a couple examples of, um, of failures that I've seen in action. Sorry, not failures that I've seen, just failures in general. <laughs> this was before my time. Um, the first example is of the Three Mile Island incident in 1979, which, if you look at it, is basically a sequence of events that added up to a pretty major disaster. Um, and the sequence of events were caused by pretty trivial things that added up. The first thing that happened was there was a blockage in the plant's polisher, which is basically a giant water filter. And these kinds of problems are not that unusual or serious. But in this case, the blockage caused moisture to leak into the plant's air system, which inadvertently tripped a couple valves, which shut down the flow of cold water into the plant's steam generator. Luckily, they had a backup cooling system for precisely the situation, but on that particular day, for reasons that no one really knows, the valves for the backup system weren't open, which disabled the backup system. Plus, the indicator in the control room showing that the backup system was disabled was actually blocked by a repair tag hanging from the switch above it. That left the reactor dependent on another backup system, but as luck would have it, the relief valve wasn't working properly that day either. And to make matters even worse, the gauge in the control room, which should have told the operators that the relief valve wasn't working, was itself not working. By the time the Three Mile Island engineers realized what was happening, it was too late. In other words, it was a major accident caused by a number of discrete events, none of which were glaring errors or spectacularly bad decisions, but all unexpectedly interacted to create a major downtime event. This kind of disaster is what Yale University sociologist Charles Perrow has famously called normal accidents, where normal does not mean that they're frequent, but is basically the kind of accident that one can expect in the normal functioning of a technologically complex operation because they're made up of thousands of individual parts, all of which interrelate in, which, in ways which are impossible to anticipate. And I bet if I were to look at your, each of your individual architectures, I bet I, they would look like a technologically complex system made up of thousands of parts. Just la um, actually maybe a month ago at this point, uh, Intuit went down for 24 hours thanks to an accidental power failure. Rackspace's data centers went down a while ago because a truck hit a transformer and killed the power. Um, about a month ago, WordPress went down along with 10 million blogs that it hosts because of an Aaron code change that overwrote the wrong thing in the database. And that brings us to the next big problem. Not only is failure inevitable, but the bigger and the more successful you are, thanks, thanks to things like Twitter, the quicker people are going to find out about your failures, and the quicker the news of your failure is going to start spreading. Clay Shirky, author of Here Comes Everybody and his new book, uh, Cognitive Surplus, and generally all-around smart guy, summarizes this really well, that unhappy customers may get some attention, but unhappy networked customers can quickly impact your business. Here's a quick example of what happened last time Google App Engine went down. Within a few minutes, Twitter was going nuts. People were wondering what was happening. They were surprised that the mighty Google would fail. People were concerned about the ramifications of Google going to Google App Engine going down. They even started talking like cats. This is what happens when uh, there's a big downtime event on Twitter. There's a huge spike in conversation about it because people start to spread news of your downtime. This behavior is so common that I actually wrote a tool that crowdsources uptime monitoring by basically watching Twitter chatter about major sites so that when there's a big spike in people saying that something is down or something is, is failing, um, you can pretty much infer that that site is down without actually doing any sort of monitoring. So in this example, I caught um, the Amazon S3 downtime that happened um, a month or two ago. And it's not just Twitter that uh, spreads news. It's vlogs, and it's Google Alerts, and it's social media monitoring tools, and it's traditional uh, media notifications that go straight to our phones now. 
So let me quickly recap. Your site's going to fail. Downtime is bad for a lot of different reasons. And everybody's going to find out about it, whether you like it or not. So it's starting to sound pretty hopeless. What can we do about it? What if we don't want to become lumberjacks? Well, here's what operations guru John Alspa has to say. He says that instead of trying to avoid failure at all costs, that we should lean into it, we should embrace it, we should let it guide our architecture, our code, and our infrastructure. And that brings us to the second approach to handling downtime, preparing for it. Now, let me quickly clarify that I'm not saying that you shouldn't work as hard as you can to avoid downtime. I think your number one goal should be to have zero downtime. The fewer times that you go down, the easier everything gets and the easier your life gets. But the problem is that downtime is still going to happen. So how do you deal with it and how do you prepare for it? And more importantly, how do you make the most of it? Well, let's look at a couple examples of how other companies have handled downtime events. The first example is of how not to handle it. On, on May 7th, uh, Facebook, their Graph API went down, their recently launched Graph API. There were, pretty quickly, there were people wondering what was going on. People were complaining that there was no word from Facebook. It ended up being down for about 13 hours. Um, throughout the event, there were blog posts wondering what was going on, complaining that there was no word from Facebook. There's a lot of speculation about the severity and whether we can trust Facebook being such an integral part of the web. The New York Times um, even wrote a story, and they included a pretty searing quote at the end, basically that an outage of this length with no official communication from the company is disturbing. And so in the case of Facebook, we end up with this feeling of disturbing. And especially for a company that wants to be at the center of our lives on the internet, that's not the kind of reaction you want to create. Um, though let me add that since I first gave this talk, um, I, got, um, I, was, I got some feedback from Facebook and they pointed me to some stuff that they're doing to, um, to improve on their transparency. So that was really good to see and, um, and that, was, uh, that was exciting. So um, you can read about that actually on, uh, on my blog, transparent.dm.com. A couple weeks ago I posted an update about that. Um, so second example, Google App Engine. On, in February of this year, February 24th, Google App Engine went down. People started noticing the problem pretty quickly. Though, notice that the tweets included, a lot of the tweets included a link to the App Engine public health dashboard, which um, Google hosts for precisely the situation. If you were to visit that health dashboard, you would see that Google is aware of the problem. They explain what's affected and what they're doing about it. They also posted an update to their dedicated App Engine downtime notification mailing list. Pretty quickly, blogs started picking up the story, as they always do, with links to the official explanation. The blogs were continued to update the story throughout the day as the downtime persisted. And one, time you one thing you notice in these, um, in these blog posts is that there's very little speculation. And that's because there's no need for speculation. Google continued to update the public about what was going on throughout the day. Basically, every hour they posted an update about what was going on. About uh, a week after the incident was over, they posted an excellent post-mortem summarizing what happened. Uh, it included a huge amount of detail about the event. They even included a minute-by-minute -minute timeline of what took place during the downtime and what they're doing to improve things for the future. Now contrast the reaction that Facebook got to what we see for Google. We see words like awesome and words like kudos and more kudos. Even uh, Jesse Robbins, one of the uh, um, authors for O'Reilly, he was the co-chair of the Velocity Conference, he used to work um, at Amazon, he even applauded how um, Google handled the downtime. There was even a story on Flashdot comparing Google's downtime to a really small data center in Australia that was the opposite of transparent, basically pretended like they weren't down at all. And so in the case of Google App Engine, we end up with this feeling of kudos. And let's not forget that this is after a major downtime event, not something that's usually a positive thing. The third and final example is um, of Atlassian. In April, on April 11th, they had a pretty serious security breach 
where a lot of passwords from longtime users were exposed. This isn't exactly the same thing as a downtime event, but it's still relevant for the point I'm trying to make. So the next morning after the breach, I got this email from them explaining exactly what happened and what they're doing about it. And let me add that if I hadn't got this email, if they hadn't reached out to me, I never would have known that there was any sort of incident. A couple hours after that initial email, I got another email which addressed some of the concerns that the initial email raised. The next day, there was a, an extremely detailed blog post by the CEO of Atlassian explaining in more detail what happened and what they're doing about it and where things are at. As I was writing this uh, talk, actually, I noticed that they've been updating this blog post with um, a status of where they're at and what they're doing about it and what's been done and what's still to be done. Rightfully so, there were a bunch of angry customers. There's actually no way to avoid getting mad at things like your passwords getting stolen from someone you trusted. But thanks to their upfront transparency, they actually came out rather well. People call them a stand-up company. Others wish that more companies would act as responsible as Atlassian, that they're outstanding. People said that this is how every company should handle things like this. They even use words like bravo. And so in the case of Atlassian, we end up with this feeling of bravo. They got applauded for their proactiveness, which I would argue builds a stronger customer relationship. These customers aren't going to be leaving Atlassian or Google because of this event. I'd say they're even more committed now. How many happy customers do you have when you go down? I'd say that it's hard enough to get this much positive feedback when you actually try to do something good. Part of the reason for this kind of response is the culture and the brand that Atlassian has built, which includes core values like this, an open, open company, no BS. And there's a reason that Atlassian and Google end up on the plus side after a big event like this, while companies like Facebook don't. It isn't a one-time event. It comes from a commitment to certain values and doing it over and over and doing right by your customer when the opportunity arises, not just when it's convenient. And that's what a downtime incident gives you, a huge opportunity to build trust and to treat your customers with respect. It's also an opportunity to destroy any trust you have with your users. It's actually a lot easier to destroy trust. It basically happens by default. Your customers have a really low bar for how they expect you to treat them. They kind of expect that you're going to screw them when you have the chance. And so if you do something good and you show that you're human, they're going to love you for it and they're going to trust you. And I'd say that in today's world, especially for web companies like ours, I think that trust is maybe the single most important asset that you can earn. So let me, let's talk about how you can use this opportunity to build trust and how you can prepare for downtime. So before I get into the um, framework that I'm going to pitch, um, I want to make the point that doing something and little parts of this is better than doing nothing. You don't have to take on everything at once. It's more of a mind shift than anything else. Um, and I'm also hoping that a lot of the stuff is obvious so that it's easy to convince your coworkers and to implement it. So this is the basic sequence of a downtime event. Life is good, then something breaks, and then you figure out what to do to keep it from breaking again. This is the basic framework that I'm going to propose. Um, it's made up of three parts, preparing prior to the event, communicating during the event, and explaining after the event. So again, the three parts are prepare, communicate, and explain. So let's start off with the first part, prepare. Step one is to create a channel of communication, a way to get news out to your users quickly and easily. So the overall goal of this channel is to tell your users what's going on. Today, without anything in place, when your users are using your service and they have a problem, they have to basically decide, is it something I'm doing wrong or is it the service's fault? And I'm willing to bet that most time they're going to assume that something's wrong with you. And so they're going to build this psychological impression that you're always broken, that something's always wrong. Instead, if you were to actually tell them when things are broken and when things are wrong through a health dashboard or a status blog that I'm going to talk about, they're going to realize that you're not actually down as often as they thought you were. And so it's a little ironic, but the more you tell your users when you're down, the less often they're going to think you're down. 
So here's a few examples of communication channels that companies offer. Amazon has an extremely solid health status dashboard that shows the status of every one of their individual services in every one of their regions. And notice along the bottom, they're actually pre-announcing a downtime they're going to have um, a maintenance window for their flexible payment service. This is Salesforce's trust.salesforce.com dashboard. This is Google App Engine's health status dashboard. And notice they're, they're not shy about showing you when things are wrong. That's very important. Google also has a special mailing list and Google group where they post more details about what's going wrong and upcoming issues, upcoming maintenance windows. Zendesk has basically a special Twitter account where they post updates and, and help customers deal with downtime events. Foursquare has a Twitter account for their API. 37 Signals has a pretty plain uh, blog where they just chronologically post status updates when things are broken. And the nice thing about a simple blog is that you have an automatic RSS feed that people can integrate with. You can even get pretty uh, creative with this kind of thing. GitHub has a pretty uh, fun health status dashboard. So it doesn't have to be boring. So this channel needs to be easy to find. Your users need to know where to look when something's wrong. I would, I would propose that you put a link to this from your support page, maybe your front page. And then you also want to try to get to the top of Google search results for things like your site and status, your site and up or your site and down, so that when people are trying to figure out what's going on, they find you wherever they go looking. You also want to try to host this communication channel off-site because obviously if you go down, the last thing you want is for this thing to go down too. And it's actually not as obvious as you think. Uh, Google and Salesforce have run into this problem. You also want to try to keep this communication channel as real-time and as automated as possible because when people experience a problem, they're going to go hit this communication channel pretty quickly. And if they don't see any sort of problem, they're going to either lose faith in the channel or they're just going to, um, or they're just going to start calling and emailing you, which defeats a lot of the purpose of this channel. I uh, actually put up a blog post maybe six months ago detailing seven keys to a successful public health dashboard that you can check out on my blog or if you just Google for keys public health dashboard. Um, I'm not going to go into them, but they basically uh, are what I just talked about, that it needs to be public, it needs to be easy to find, real time, and transparent. So the first step, communication channel. Second step is you need a process in place that makes it easy and stress-free to deal with downtime events. The goal should be to make this event as procedural as possible. The most important thing you want to formally address is who has the authority to communicate externally during an event and to take customer-facing actions. Who makes the call? Who needs to be involved? Who do, you, who do you need to escalate to? This is also where you figure out what you're legally allowed to say and make sure that you don't have to go through a long process when downtime hits. There's also something I like to call the mean time to communicate, basically an SLA for how quickly you commit to notifying your users when something goes wrong. And this is in addition to the real time dashboard that shows problems right away. This is the part where you as a real person acknowledge the problem and give a little more detail about what you're doing about it and when you think things will be recovered. Now there's no hard and fast rule here. Um, basically just make it as tight as you can and see how your users respond. And last, obviously, you need to be ready to deal with the actual issue, which I assume everybody here has in some form or another. That's a whole separate talk. And that's pretty much it for this prepare step. That's really all you need to do. Um, and if you do, if you do this, you're ahead of maybe 99% of companies out there. So now the incident hits, your site goes down, your servers are in trouble. And that brings us to the second step, the communicate phase, which, as you would think, is basically where you communicate what's going on during the incident. Since you've, pre since you've prepared, all you really need to do is use the communication channel that we talked about in the previous step. You want to try to get an update out to your users within the meantime to communicate, assuming that you also have the real-time issues show up as they happen. In your communication, you want to explain what's affected by the outage and what parts of your system are having issues so that you, your users know whether they have to care about this or not, whether it affects them. You want to talk about when the incident started so that your users can map that to incidents that they're seeing on their side. 
And also very important, maybe most important, is if you can, give some sort of an idea of when you think things are going to recover. This is unfortunately hard, hard to figure out in most cases, and more unfortunately is what users are going to want to see. But just do what you can, and just give them an idea of when you think things will be back. Is it Just give a rough order of mass, uh, magnitude, if nothing else. And the reason this is important to your users is they have to figure out, should I be failing over to my backup system? Should I just go grab a cup of coffee? Should I be sitting here watching um, things as they happen? Now, the initial post is good, but you also want to make sure to be updating your users regularly throughout the incident so that they are aware of how far you are from resolving and what is actually going on. One big takeaway that um, I've learned from watching these kinds of things is that users don't actually care about your downtime as much as you think they do. What bothers them most is just not knowing what's going on, not having an explanation, not having a sense of control over the situation. And so simply knowing that you are aware of a problem, that you're the one that's at fault, makes them feel a lot better. And so that allows them to just sit around and wait for it to recover or go, like I said, go grab their cup of coffee. So the communicate phase, the last part, part is just uh, just fix the problem. You know, Don't forget about uh, bringing your servers back online. You can't just talk about it. I won't get into that part. So your servers come back online. You fix it. And we get to the final phase, the explain phase, which is mostly made up of a postmortem, which is basically an explanation of what went wrong. Ideally, you post this publicly within a week of the incident. And the overall goal is to explain what happened and to give your customers confidence that you're taking this type of stuff seriously, that you know what you're doing, and that things are going to improve. First thing you want to do in your postmortem is admit failure. You don't want to pretend like it wasn't your fault. You don't want to blame other parts of your infrastructure, even if it is their fault. Say your cloud provider goes down. In the end, it's your fault. Your customers are using your service, and your service was down. So just admit that. You don't have to be too clever. This is a little screenshot of when uh, WordPress went down a few, I think it was a year ago. Right up front, they admitted they were down. It was the worst downtime they had in four years. So just be pretty straightforward about that. Maybe the most important thing is you want to make sure that you sound like a human. Big companies are really, really good at avoiding this. This is really, really important because in order to be in order to be believed, in order to build trust, you have to sound authentic. And if you don't sound human, they're just going to disregard this whole this whole um, process and your whole attempt at building trust. So do everything you can to sound as human as possible. The last thing you want to do is say something like this, which is pretty much what everybody says. The problem is it doesn't say anything. It doesn't sound human. It basically means nothing. The guys at 37 Signals put it really well that if if you spill some coffee on someone or you bump into them on the street, are you going to say, oh, I'm, I apologize for any inconvenience that may have caused you? No, that sounds pretty ridiculous. You know, Maybe instead say something like, we screwed up and we're sorry and here's what we're doing to keep it from happening again. There's no formula here because that would, be, that would almost defeat the purpose. So just do what you can, be honest and authentic. Next, you want to talk about when the incident started and when it ended so that your users can tie that to what they saw. I mentioned that Google App Engine had a, a timeline from the beginning to the end. They basically had every five minutes what happened, who was working on what, and what went wrong. Um, so the reason this is more important than you may think is a lot of times your customers have to report what happened to their customers, and having details like this is really important for them. You also want to talk about who was impacted, what was impacted. This is hopefully you can reuse from the communicate step. And the reason this is important is for users to know whether they need to care about this, whether they need to look into certain parts of their infrastructure. Maybe they want to re-architect based on some of these issues that you've experienced. The meat of the postmortem is basically an explanation of what went wrong, what happened, what broke, and how did you deal with it. This little screenshot is an example of when Zendesk went down, and they explained what happened, which in their case was a combination of some bad DNS records that was partly user error. And their data center's network went down at the same time, so they spent a lot of time trying to figure out that they were trying to realize that they're um, unrelated issues and they had to deal with them separately. And
And that brings us to the final key piece, which is to talk about what you learned from the experience and what you're doing to improve for the future. Um, and this is really important because your users need to believe that you're improving, that you're taking this seriously, that you know what you're doing. In this example from 140.com, they put out three solid lessons that they learned. I think it was number one, set up some external performance monitoring, number two, fix the root problem that caused their downtime, which is pretty obvious, and third is make the alerts that they're getting from all their different monitoring systems, make, make sure that they make sense and that they're actionable. And that's pretty much it. That's pretty much all you need in the postmortem step. Uh, I've actually, um, I put out just this postmortem part of the, of the steps on my blog maybe six, seven months ago. And I got this really great comment from, uh, from a reader that implemented just that last step at his company. And it looks like he got some really, really good reaction and, and uh, response to it. So that was really good to see. And I uh, actually met him at a conference where I presented this. And uh, I was happy to see it wasn't just my mom pretending to be uh, some user. So other than the outward communication, the other key piece is to actually take the lessons that you learned to heart and to actually improve for the future. Obviously, if you keep failing and nothing improves, it doesn't really matter how great your postmortems are. Some of the takeaways that Google, Google uh, in their App Engine downtime introduced is they introduced some new features for their data store, allowing the customers to choose whether they prefer a fast data store or whether they prefer a more reliable data store. They also talked about how they're redoing their training and on-call documentation processes. And that kind of work actually leads to even more positive reaction. There's a, a site called Hacker News where they posted this downtime postmortem. And the number one rated comment was from a user that commented that not only is Google saying they're sorry, they're implementing serious changes which represent millions of dollars of development. And so your customers appreciate that kind of thing, especially when you go beyond just talking about it. And I mentioned this Google App Engine postmortem a number of times, and that's because it's pretty much the best postmortem that I've seen. So if you're looking for a model or some ideas, I would definitely check this out. You can uh, find it on my blog, uh, or you can just Google for Google App Engine postmortem. The overriding goal of this phase is basically to be human and to sound authentic. We know that people make mistakes, and we forgive, as long as we feel that we can trust them. And that means you should be transparent. You shouldn't try to hide the problem. And that means you need to accept responsibility, make it clear that the buck stops here. And you need to make it clear that you're learning and that you're improving and that things are going to get better as the users continue to use your service. And almost all of this ends up coming down to the simple idea of trust. Can your users trust you? That's really what all of this is about, and everything we've talked about is giving you the tools to create that trust. Here's a little cheat sheet that, um, that covers everything that I've talked about in the framework so far that you can use um, if you wanted to check this out later. Um, and I think that you can use the same kind of process for any sort of disaster, say a security breach or a big bug that you just discovered that you, don't wanna, that you um, naturally wouldn't want to talk about publicly. And in the end, it just comes down to being prepared, being transparent, and being human. And that, comes, that ends up basically coming down to the simple idea of trust that we just talked about. I'm going to give a link to this framework at the end of my talk. So if you're interested in um, checking it out and using it, then you can uh, see that at the end of the talk. So one more disclaimer is that you can't be going down all the time and expect to turn each of those incidents into an opportunity. It's a fine line. This isn't some sort of cure-all cure -all that solves all your problems and that you can just go down all the time. I actually try to put some thought into what kind of rule of thumb I could give for how often you can go down as long as you're upfront about it. And in the end, I concluded that it all depends on the severity of your downtime, how well you handle it, how many times you've gone down in the past. But the good news is that if you handle downtime well, if you use a framework like this and prepare for it and build trust with your users, the less of an emotional imprint it's going to leave in their head, which means that they're not going to remember it as well. It's going to fade away more quickly, which means you can go down more often. So that's good news. Now, the last part, maybe the most important, is how do you get this type of stuff adopted at your company? Here are a few tactics. The first is a um, little bit of game theory. Hopefully, everyone can follow this. 
Now, along the top are your choices, whether you are whether you choose to be transparent or not. And along the left are the realities of whether your big problem in downtime is exposed, whether people whether your customers find out about it or not. So, say you go down, you don't tell anyone about it, you hide it, and no one catches you. In a sense, that's a win because you don't have to admit any sort of failure, no one realized that you're down, and you didn't have to spend any time up front preparing for this kind of thing. So, it's a win. It's a little bit of a dirty win, but it's a win. Now, say that news of your downtime spreads and that everyone finds out about it while you pretend that it never happened. That's bad news. That's pretty much what happened with the Facebook case study we looked at. This is what you want to avoid. And unfortunately, this is the standard approach that most companies use today. Now say that you were transparent and you got out ahead of the downtime. This is what happened with the Google App Engine example. And as we saw, the result was really positive, especially since in this case you would have been exposed anyway. The last case is when you tell the world about an incident when no one would have known about it otherwise. This is basically what happened in the Atlassian case where they had a security breach that no one outside would have ever known about. And again, as we saw in the example, it was a win. They came out on the positive side. So it's looking pretty good for the transparency case, but even more importantly is the fact that it's getting more and more likely that people are going to catch your downtime. And so the choices are going to become really simple in the future as social media proliferates and as we get more connected. Maybe this won't happen today, maybe it won't happen next week, but I think in a few years, even if you're a small company, your downtime issues and other problems that you have are going to become public knowledge pretty quickly. And so this is a good time to start preparing for that. Now, if that's not enough for you, here's a handy dandy list of the benefits that you can use. Number one, we already talked about. You, we gain trust with your users. Second one, we pretty much talked about that you reduce churn, you increase your customer loyalty. The third is you reduce your support costs. Your customers won't be calling you randomly to check if something's wrong, especially when you go down. They're not going to uh, flood you with emails and calls to figure out what's going on and to be told the same thing over and over and over. The fourth benefit is you get the ability to control the message. You don't allow users and the media to speculate about what's going on. You get out ahead of the, of the issues. It also gives you a competitive advantage especially if your competitors don't have something like this already. Um, it also gives you more time to focus on the actual problem, especially for a small company that doesn't have dedicated people to answering phones and emails. This uh, gives you a chance to, for your customers to serve themselves without having to call and email you and give you more time to fix the problem. And then maybe most importantly for people like us is it reduces stress that if you prepare for this kind of thing and you have a procedural process in place, you don't have to stress out as much. Still, it's not going to be easy to get something like this adopted. Changing anything, especially at a big company, is painful and slow, but it's not impossible. Here's a few things that um, I see as the keys to getting this kind of thing adopted at a big company. The biggest thing is you have to get over this default culture of hide the problem. When you're a kid and you break your mom's vase, your natural reaction is to pretend like it wasn't your fault, you want to blame someone else, you don't, want, you don't know what she's talking about. But as you grow up, you realize that you're much better off just being upfront and admitting to the problem. And so, in a sense, that's what companies have to realize. In a sense, companies have to grow up. And just as important is the motivation and the commitment to actually want to improve things. Otherwise, when things break or go down, you'll either have nothing to say or it'll just be a bunch of happy talk that does more harm than good. One way to look at transparency is that it forces you to be a better company because you have to follow through and live up to the expectations you set, which I think is a really good thing. Now to do all this, you actually need resources to actually fix problems and to improve them and to create something like a communication channel. So I'm hoping that I gave you some ammo to build that case. A lot of this gets easier and a lot of the building of this case gets easier if you're experiencing a lot of pain with downtime today, especially if it's just the perception of, of what your downtime creates. So if you're experiencing this kind of problem, you actually have very little to lose to try something like this. In the end, this usually comes down to getting buy-in from a lot of different people. So let me see if I can help you with that. There's basically four departments that you have to deal with. There's product management, there's support, there's the technical side of the company, engineering and operations, and there's the sales and marketing departments. 
The first is product management, which a lot of times defaults to the position that they'd rather wait until their customers start complaining before they blast the entire customer base with an, kind of an upfront explanation of, of something being broken. The reality is that proactiveness is a million times better than than um, responding to the incident after the fact, that over-communicating is a lot better than under-communicating. Your customers are going to be a lot more likely to forgive you if you let them know before they realize that there's a problem. It's a lot harder to give the impression that you're trustworthy by apologizing after the fact. Now, the support department may say that we have enough work to do. We don't want to be managing another process or another channel of communication. The reality is that it's a little bit more work up front, but during the actual incident, when they get most stressed out and are overloaded, that's when this kind of framework kicks in and reduces the amount of work they have to deal with because the customers can serve themselves. Another benefit to support is that a lot of times the support department doesn't even know that anything's broken. They're out of the loop a lot of times. And so they can simply visit an automated health dashboard to see that something's wrong. They are more in the loop. And more importantly, they can send customers there without having to field a lot of calls and emails. Uh, the engineering and operations department is probably the easiest department to convince. But sometimes uh, techie people don't want to admit that anything's wrong. They don't want to look bad. But these kinds of things are great opportunities to learn and to improve, which, uh, which technical people love. And it is also, they also really respect when other people are transparent and open about what they're doing. And so I think the case there is pretty simple. Unfortunately, the sales and marketing departments are probably the hardest departments to convince because they basically don't want anything to ever go wrong. They don't want to create any sort of negative communication to customers. The reality is that things are going to go wrong and your customers are going to find out about them. And so you're better off trying to control the message. Another tactic with this department is you could use fear. What if your competitors launched a transparency initiative? Here's the full slide if you want to check it out later without the grayness. And a little bit more ammo. Here's a bunch of companies that are using elements of the framework and are being transparent about their downtime. Um, I have actually a, a link on my blog to a delicious tag with a collection of all the public health dashboards and, and blogs that I found over the years of companies being open about their downtime. So you can check those out for ideas. And that's pretty much it. Unfortunately, your site is still going to fail. It's still going to hurt and be painful. But in the end, it comes down to how well you've prepared for that failure. I've always wanted to use a Nietzsche quote in the talk. So here's an appropriate one that I found, that the measure of, of a society is how well it transforms pain and suffering into something worthwhile. Or better said, the measure of a company is how well it transforms the pain of downtime into something worthwhile. So if you take nothing else away from this talk, Go create a special Twitter account that you post updates to as things happen. Make sure you tell your customers about it. And make sure you keep it up. And that's all. Thank you very much. You can find the slides at the URL here. You can find the framework on my blog along the right side. Uh, there's my Twitter handle. And that's it. So I think we're going to jump into questions. So let me pull that up real quick. Move that over here. Hey, Catherine, the, uh, the questions list is blocked by the notes, so I can't read them, unfortunately. Oh, Lenny? That yeah. is... Sorry. Need... Oh, OK. There that is the question list. OK. Ah, there it is. All right, cool. So let's see. So the first first question is by Paolo. How about plan downtime? Can you speak about that? Yeah, that's a good question. So basically, we all have to go down every once in a while for maintenance. And no one has any problems with, oh, I hear the bit.ly link is down. So I'm going to fix that after the talk. I apologize for that. Um, OK, back to the question. So maintenance maintenance um, times. Yeah, so. Um, so that's the good news with maintenance is that you can pre-announce that um, and you can communicate to your users ahead of time that your site's down, which is obviously a lot better than waiting for them to figure out that you're down during the actual maintenance. So, um, so what I found is that you want to let them know maybe a week ahead of time 
depends on the length and um, the severity of the maintenance, but you want to let them know ahead of time. You want to have some sort of um, maybe some sort of messaging in your product that they log into so that they won't miss it when they log in. You ideally may um, send them a notice if it's a pretty serious planned outage. Um, you send them a notification a week or two ahead of time to let them know that it's going to be going down. You also want to do this, you know, in the middle of the night or on a weekend when it's not inconveniencing them. Um, if you have a communication channel, that's the perfect place to put this kind of thing because they'll visit it every once in a while and just notice, oh yeah, we have a, there's an up, upcoming maintenance window, um, and so that they're aware. Um, yeah, so hopefully that answers your question. Um, let's see, next question by Alberto. Isn't there a danger of transparency becoming the easy way out, like politicians apologizing for a scandal without taking responsibility for it? Yep, that's definitely danger. And so, yeah, so you definitely can't go down too much and pr assume that just kind of explaining that something is broken and we're improving and we apologize over and over, that that's going to save you. It's, it's hard to say how often you can go down and be transparent and explain that things are broken. I think, I think if companies were to reach this other extreme of using transparency to take the easy way out, that would, uh, that would be a really good thing because we're on the other extreme right now where it's very hard to convince anyone to talk about anything negative. So I don't, I don't see that being a big problem, but that's, a, that's an interesting thought. Um, I, think, I think people see through companies pretending like they actually care and pretending like they're doing something about the downtime. Um, so it's a good question. And then the next question, also by Alberto, is remuneration or restitution ever part of the postmortem? Okay, so how do you know when to go to this level? So basically, do you want to? When do you give credits to customers? Um, when do you give them free service in exchange for the downtime? That's a that's a really important topic, and that's that's something you need to work out with the people, with you know your executives at your company to figure out what what SLAs have you set up for your company and for your users. That's a uh, that's usually what um, that's usually what users are going to be looking for. The thing that I found is that, that even if you offer them credits or a free service or a refund, if you exceed some sort of SLA, most often they don't even ask for that as long as you admit to the problem and you feel, make them feel that something's going wrong. That's I could see that being a big concern for uh, for being transparent. That why should we tell anyone something's wrong because they're going to come ask for their money back? But the reality of it is that if you do admit that you went wrong and they don't discover it on their own and then kind of um, hold you accountable for it, that they're not going to ask you for for the credits most times. I think it's like 5% five, five of, of customers actually ask for that kind of thing. But it's a great thing to have, um, to have credits and to have some sort of SLA that users can look to. Because that, that's important when they're buying your service. You know, they, they see that you're going to be up because you promised these SLAs. Next question is by Ilya. Is it good or not to have a public heartbeat web page such as Google has? Hmm, I'm not sure what the public heartbeat page that Google has is. Uh, I know uh, Skype has a <laughs> has a pretty cool health status dashboard that's a little beating heart, um, but I don't think that's what uh, you're talking about there. So I presume that's a public, you mean a public health dashboard? And yes, I definitely think that is a good thing to have a public health dashboard. Um, so if that's not what you're what you're saying, uh, I would say try to clarify that. Um, and then the next question is by John: Why are we so tolerant of tolerant of Twitter's fail well? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. That comes down to the ROI of how how useful is the service to me and how how big a deal is the downtime. And basically, what we're what people have found is that Twitter is that so useful to them and that downtime is so not big a deal to them that they're willing to deal with it. Partly because they understand that Twitter has scaling issues and partly because it's not days at a time that it's kind of on and off. And I think part of it also is it's a consumer and service and people aren't paying for it. You know, what can you, what can you expect from something like that that provides so much value to so many people? I think a little downtime every once in a while is fine. And the other thing is there's no huge competitor to Twitter that's made a a relevant kind of impact on the space, so our options are limited. But you know, Twitter does have a health status dashboard. They have a pretty simple blog where they post updates. They've been being they've been uh, pretty transparent recently about their scaling issues. 
about they're building a data center, they're re-architecting their backup system. Um, John Adams was at the Velocity Conference talking about how, uh, how they deal with downtime. They actually have a fail, uh, whales per second metric that they watch to figure out how many times they're failing. So let me see. I think that's all the questions we have. Oh, there's a new one <laughs> by Paolo. Does Apple iTunes have a health status page? I, I do not know of one. That's a good question. I, I don't know of one. They should. I've, I haven't actually seen it down. It, I could see it being slow. But I don't, you know, Apple is not, <laughs> Apple is not good at transparency. They, uh, they're almost the opposite. They, uh, they want to pretend that nothing's ever wrong until uh, everyone uh, complains about it. But in kind of, in, as a consequence, they have to work extra hard to make amazing products, which they do pretty well. So that's a good question. Do you have, do you have any comments on the way they've handled the uh, iPhone 4? Yeah, um, that's a... I was I was going to blog about that, but I kind of ran out of time. I, it's, they kind of got to the point where they had to admit something, which is unfortunate because they resist and resist and resist, mostly because it works. They don't have to be as transparent as other companies because their products are so amazing. But once they got, um, once they were forced into it, and they had a they kind of went to the other extreme. They had a press conference, Steve Jobs up on stage, and it was great how he admitted. You know, even though we don't see that there's a problem. We're going to accept that you guys um, feel that there's a problem, and we're going to fix it. So that was an, that was a pretty interesting way to solve it. And it feels like the, the kind of the problem has mostly gone away. They had a huge quarter, <laughs> and everyone's getting free bumpers. So I think they handled it pretty well after the, they got forced into it. Well, plenty of people are buying the phones. It's not right? stopping them. <laughs> exactly. Okay. So oh, I can't say that name, Ilya. Uh, just posted the link for the yeah I saw that yeah Google Heart yeah. page but we can't right. we can't click away to that at the moment. Um, I think that's all the questions that we have and I just want to thank you Lenny for doing this webcast and I really enjoyed it again and I want to thank <laughs> everyone else for joining in today and I um, hope you all got a lot out of it and that you will enjoy it too. And as Lenny said, his slides are available on his site. They're great slides. And no oh wait, Paul, I can't. I'm mangling names today. That's that's a good question. Would you let your users post issues about your services on your blog? Hmm. To post. So when they see a site is down, kind of just post a comment or a or a blog post when they notice right, something's wrong. They're going to be talking about it somewhere. Yeah. So I, I wonder if Paolo's out talking about my personal blog or on the blog of the individual companies that are going down. Hmm. Would you like users post issues about your service on your blog? Of a, a blog of a company. Yeah, that's that's something I've been hoping someone would do, and I've been thinking about doing it as some sort of just public place that people can go and complain about things being down, kind of aggregate downtime based on. Um, what people are saying. There's a there's a mailing list outages.org has that I just found recently that tries to do this. So um, that might be the best place for this kind of thing. We did. Yeah, it's tough for it's tough for companies to want users to complain about things publicly. So I think that's a hard thing to buy buy into. But but that would be cool. Maybe we could create kind of a a neutral place that people can go and find that things are down. Yeah, we had we had a customer service. Uh, we had a recently had a problem right before I saw your talk, Lenny. So that's why it hit home so much. Where it was our deal of the day that sort of brought our site down. Apparently, people really liked it. So um, it was down on a Friday and then all weekend too. So John knows a lot more about that than I do. But it was an experience for us to learn how to contact <laughs> all these people. And people, we were on Twitter and Facebook. I shouldn't say we because I wasn't, but the people I work with worked the entire weekend responding to everyone. And oh, wow. it was thousands of people. So they made a point yeah, that's, of answering everyone. That's, that's awesome that you did that. That's, that's what's tricky now is there's so many places that people are complaining that you have to kind of look around everywhere. And, and, and if you have a central place like a dashboard or a mailing list, then um, just using that generally is much more effective. That's something we should think about in the future. 
So, I mean, our company. But um, we're learning a lot. So cool. I, I, we're going over time, and I don't want to keep people because I know a lot of people have to rush off to their next meeting. But again, thank you so much for doing this. I, I love the talk. We'll have the recording available um, in a day or two, and we'll send everyone the link to the recording if you want to view it again or share it with, with uh, colleagues. I recommend it. And um, check out Lenny's site. It's a great site. So thank you, everyone, and thanks, Lenny. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for listening. <laughs>